Hello, um, hello, welcome everybody to this uh, diversity session. I'm Armando Ruiz and I'm the head of telecom engineering for NCR. And we're uh, proud to sponsor these breakout sessions. Um, we're a very active member of the community here. I hope everybody's familiar with our brand new campus. We've, we've been there a couple of years in Midtown, but diversity is a very important thing for NCR. We won a number of awards in that category. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm glad that you're all coming and are interested in this topic. So with that, I'm gonna pass the, the microphone to Adam, who will be helping uh, and leading the discussion panel. We have great panelists today for you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And welcome everybody to our panel today where we're gonna be discussing diversity and inclusion being a key part of high functioning teams. And joining me up front uh, this morning is Peter Williams from BlackRock. I also have Stephen, and Stephen, I'm going to slaughter that last name. I'm going to go with Aishetha. Ichatha, okay. With Google, and then Richard Smith, uh, who is a managing partner with Benton and Bradford. So kind of with a limited amount of time, why don't we just kind of jump right into the topic, gentlemen. Uh, in no particular order, one of the very first things we need to do when we start talking about diversity and inclusion is let's define diversity first. Kind of like, um, I think we were on our call the other day and I said one of the greatest things about Bear Bryant was when he rebuilt the Alabama football team, even though I'm a fan of UGA, he stood in front of an entire team and said, gentlemen, this is a football, and they worked from there. So, gentlemen, what is diversity? And let's work from that definition. Hey, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in first. Um, one of the things that we do at Benton Bradford is we help companies kind of define what that means for them. And what we've often found is that when 10 people in the, enter the room, there are 10 different definitions of diversity. So it, it's really important for your organizations to kind of figure out what that means. But on a very elemental level, the way that, that we kind of look at diversity and inclusion is to say it is just a mixture of things that have similarities, differences, related tensions and complexity. So if you have more than one thing, you have diversity, depending on how you look at it. But, but that in a very simple way is, is how you can be, begin to define diversity for your organization. Excellent. Oh. Oh. Cheers, thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more, right? So I, I, at Google, we talk about the notion of diversity and inclusion being decoupled. Because oftentimes people put those two terms together. And the metaphor that we often use is diversity is having multiple people come attend your party. And inclusion is ensuring each and every one of those people has a good time and has an opportunity to have fun at your party. So it's not just enough to have a company that touts themselves as being diverse. Inclusion has to be a, a, a big key in ensuring innovation in the company. It's good to see everyone, good morning. Um, you know, when we decided to build an operation here in Atlanta, you know, I, I, I look back at those early days, we've been here just over a year, um, and something that we always talk about at BlackRock is the iceberg, uh, the diversity iceberg. Um, the iceberg, you know, what's above the water line are the things that you see with your naked eye. That's gender, ethnicity, um, but the problem is, is that a lot of times that is what we only look at in terms of diversity. And when we're focused on diverse hiring, um, that's the easiest things to identify, especially as we put together diverse slates um, and other, you know, diverse approaches and making sure that we're building diverse, um, a diverse workforce. However, what's below the waterline is also extremely important. And so, you know, a lot of our choice of selecting Atlanta was really trying to tap a talent pool with diverse backgrounds and experiences. So there's a lot of other things that you can't see in an individual or a professional, um, but all of those things is what makes up diversity. That's excellent, Stephen. It kind of, is it, yeah. Now it is. Oh, yeah. So, Stephen, you're kind of going to lead us into our, our next question, right? So we have diversity and we have inclusion. We're kind of marrying them together. But diversity is a little bit more than what I always say to people, what I can see or what I can garner from a very quick conversation. So why don't you guys talk to us a little bit about, we talk about really peeling the diverse onion back. We're looking at backgrounds, experience, education level. Uh, there's a whole host of things back there. How do you get that data back from a person? Because if we're going to build on this concept, as we're going to do in this panel, how do, you, how do you mine out that type of data from somebody to get that experiential diversity also? 
one of the things that we do at Benton Bradford, um, because we're also an executive search firm, is we begin asking people questions about their experience. Typically, someone will give us a profile that they're looking for in terms of a person. Educational background, years of experience, the type of job, types of things they'll be doing on the job. And then we'll make sure that we're going on and looking in diverse places. So they'll say, hey, we really want someone from CPG, or we really want someone that came from the Northeast. And we'll go out and we'll look in those places, but we'll also look in other places as well. Because what we have found in our search business is that sometimes the best candidate comes from the most unlikely places. Everybody want, wants what I call Jose Black Bear. They want someone who speaks Spanish, who is Native American, who has lived in Japan as well as China, and has and speaks and is somewhat fluent in, in Italian, and went to Harvard. Everybody wants that person, but oftentimes the best person will come from some of the most unlikely places. And you're like, wow, I never would have thought to look there. But that's our job in search is to make sure that we kind of uncover all of those places and look. And through that interview process, you can discover the richness of someone's background. Because when you look at the resume, what they actually tell you they did and how they did it doesn't always translate from the resume. Yeah, I, I totally think it's, uh, it's one word, right? It's intentionality. You have to be intentional about diversity and inclusion. And so capitalizing on what you talked about, searching for hires, we do a ton of things to promote that. One of the things that I'm very proud of that Google does is build into the job descriptions neutrality, right? So that someone doesn't feel, when they look at a job description, intimidated because it's biased towards one gender or another, as an example. Um, other things that we do is community engagement and contextualizing locally. And so what that means is you can actually get the spirit of the community to give you that lens if you don't have it in your company. There's a ton of other things I don't think we have enough time, but uh, <laughs> totally, um, so we have a lot of things uh, product-wise that we can also talk about. I want to pick up on intentionality too, because I think that's a really, really important point. I had mentioned sort of diverse slates. Um, obviously, you want to you want to bring in a diverse group of people um, to evaluate and see if they fit the the opportunity. However, a lot of us forget is the folks that we choose to interview those diverse candidates also need to be a diverse group of people. Um, because a lot of times, I will go in with my own conscious biases, or unconscious biases, I mean, and I'll just choose someone that I have similar interests with, or I will want to select someone that maybe will look like me, um, or I think that I can go get a beer with after, after work. So I think as much as we put together diverse slates, we need to focus on exactly who and what types of folks that we have interviewing those candidates. And so that's gender, that's age, that's experience, that's you know how long have they been with the, the company versus not long. I mean, it's great to have a mix of tenures as well. Um, so just that intentionality, I think, is, is extremely important. So we've talked about going and trying to find the diverse talent. Look, and to actually put together a high-functioning team made of diverse persons is a very challenging and sometimes scary, often kind of confronted project. So can you guys talk to us about some of the challenges that you face trying to put these types of teams together in real life? One of the things that some of the teams face is just how to manage all of these differing ways of doing things. And I think it really boils down to each group, as if you're in a work group, really trying to understand what is the job that needs to be done and what are the most appropriate ways to get that job done? And then everyone agree on that process so that you're not falling back on what everyone's done before, someone's favorite way to do it, what's easy to do, but you're really falling back and saying, you know what, we said we were gonna make these decisions around these criteria in this following manner, following this process. And when you do that, what you find is diverse teams will bring together many, many different types of ideas, but then you're able to kind of sift through rank order, prioritize those ideas, and, think, and say to yourself and your team, hey, let's move down the list in this way. And that way everyone feels heard, everyone feels like they contributed, everyone feels like, you know what, that was my idea, but it's really not that good. It's really number 10, let's not proceed. I was kind of in my moment. And then that way everybody can make the decision 
and it's not based upon personality or seniority. It's based upon the best idea in the room. Yeah, uh, going back to the whole intention, right? So let's be realistic. It's not oftentimes that you'll find companies that have a diverse leadership group, as an example, a diverse set of folks who make decisions. So how do you combat that? So the way we do it is, I would say, a couple of ways. One is programmatically by putting structures in place that ensure even as you walk in the room, you feel included. And so uh, one of the things that we do in each of our meeting rooms, we have a little cheat sheet on inclusion, inclusion, inclusion best practices. Let people talk, assume you know, say good intentions, create a safe environment. So make sure those structures are in place to create that safety net for any one person who may walk in and feel outnumbered by the numbers. Uh, so the programmatic structures are in place. Secondly, and probably more important, is engagement at the grassroots level. So at Google, we're very proud to have 16 employee resource groups, 25,000 employees who participate in that. And they provide a lens which otherwise we would not be able to see. I'll give you just a brief example. Um, one of the ERG's Disability Alliance has Accessibility Week every year where you know just come together and talk about ideas. And one of the ideas that came out of that was the notion of live transcribe. So if you're a person who's hard of hearing or you're losing your hearing, what about if you're in a room and it's dark and people are talking and you can't read lips anymore? How about if you could tap on your phone and everything they say comes up to you transcribed and you can read it? Now take that into the meeting rooms and imagine someone who, because they were not a member of the majority, had a problem hearing and for several years kept quiet about it. But now there's closed caption in the meeting and you can see as people talk, you can see what people are saying. So those are just little things that come not from the top down strategic, this is something we wanna do, but from the grassroots level from our ERGs. Um, and I think the only thing that I would add is, you know, going back to, we, uh, you know, I think this morning we heard D&I, we heard it presented as D&I. Um, I, we, we talk about it as I and D. If you do not build or are not focused on constantly working towards ensuring that you have an inclusive culture, you won't retain the diversity. And to be honest, I don't know if any of the diverse candidates or, you know, I mean, I, I actually want to just correct myself there. It's like everyone represents diversity, but anyone that comes into your workplace, a vast majority of them will not feel comfortable and will not stay. Um, you know, and so going back and hitting on uh, my friend here talking about ERGs and the importance of them, just last week, uh, we're trying to do, you know, we're a, we're a growing team in Atlanta, and so trying to get those off the ground have been a huge priority. But our LGBTQ network, um, there was a few individuals that came to me and wanted to do some trainings or some sessions on microaggressions. And this is a concept that actually I, I think we need to be talking about a lot more in the workplace because I don't think we quite understand the impact that we have with not intending to have any malice or negative intent. Um, but there was a, an employee who was going out of town for the weekend um, with a male friend. So he was a guy going out of town with a male friend and the manager just assumed they were together because of his known sexual orientation. And for he, he was just like, well, no, I'm, I'm, it's a college buddy that I'm going out of town yeah. with. So there was this automatic feeling of discomfort, even though the manager really wasn't meaning anything by it, but just sort of insinuating or assuming that they were romantically involved. And so all of a sudden, we created this very uncomfortable situation in the workplace and also created an environment where he didn't necessarily feel comfortable talking about what, what he had going on outside the workplace. So there's a lot of very interesting things that can happen, but I do think talking about and confronting microaggressions and some of these other things, when uh, it's not about negative intent, it's people, people may want to do the right thing and say the right thing and are trying to engage in the right way, but sometimes we don't really know about these things. Can, can I jump in real quick? You know, you bring up a very important point, and a lot of times when we're working with companies and talking about diversity and inclusion, there are two things that automatically come up um, for us in, in this discussion is that one is, uh, well, really three. One is culture, is creating the appropriate culture to have an inclusive environment. 
but people often don't understand what that means. And two things that have to exist in that culture in order for diversity and inclusion to exist is trust and candor. And really understanding, because even in the situation that you just brought up, you have to have trust to want to talk about it, right? You got to trust and have that ability to say, hey, I want to have this conversation. There may be some misunderstandings. Because of the trust, I'm going to assume good intent. But then the candor to actually open up and talk about it and really talk about those two things in a way that will enable diversity and inclusion to flourish. I've never seen diversity and inclusion flourish in an environment where there was low trust and low candor. Mm -hmm. So as we think about culture, organizations have ways of quantifying culture through engagement. There are actual cultural surveys that are done and things that you can do within your environment that are structural like you talk about at Google that can enhance that culture so that when people come through the door, they feel like, hey, you know, I just got a big hug. You know, I feel, yeah. you know, you know, if I make a mistake here, people aren't going to hit me with a sharp elbow. They might pull me to the side. They may coach me. They may mentor. They may develop and sponsor me. But it's a place that I can truly be myself and bring my authentic self to work. You know, that's excellent. And, and so let's kind of shift the conversation a little bit. And I'm sure there's people out in the audience that go, that sounds great. I would love to have this diverse, high-functioning team that you guys are talking about. But has anybody else noticed there's a person shortage out there? Anybody else notice that there's a talent shortage out there, right? We have more jobs and we have physical bodies to throw at them right now. So talk to us a little bit about how you can attract diverse talent to your organizations and trying to overcome some of those pitfalls in the labor shortage that we're seeing and especially in the tech space. Um, I'll just jump in. Um, I think, you know, I, I, uh, purpose was brought up this morning. Um, and I think that, you know, it's very important to not only, I mean, really ground all of your employees and your culture in a very strong purpose. And I think also what it does over time is, is allows people to bring out their personal purpose. I think that that's going to be critical to attract talent. But then again, you talk about, you know, um, the, the demand and the little supply. I would actually argue that there's a lot more supply out there than we think, but the problem is we're not taking enough risk. I think we all as employers could take more risks on people, um, and I think we all also have a responsibility for the workforce. There's an amazing workforce here in Atlanta, but the problem is, is we're not doing our part um, to give back to the community and upskill um, and provide programs that develop our workforce for the future. And so I think there's a combination of things that we can do programmatically to focus on workforce development, but at the same time, I also think um, it's okay if we, if we take some risk on people, because I think it'd be amazing to see what the outcomes are. Um, and we'll only you know, further enrich um, our workplace. Yeah, uh, I like um, I, I like I like what you said, right? The, so there's the creating a culture, like you said, which is attractive for folks, so that they want to work for you, right? There's also the notion of building a community engagement model that allows people in the community to trust you as a company and to choose you as the employer of choice. So community engagement is absolutely important. We've been very privileged to call Atlanta home for 19 years. How many of you know there's a Google office in Atlanta? Okay, maybe half of you. There's half that have no idea we've been here 19 years, over 350 employees. We have a Midtown office. We have a data center. And so there is a presence here in Atlanta, and it's just about building that community engagement, building that funnel, that workforce, that one day, maybe not today, to your point, but in the future will look to come work for us. One additional thing to add is I, I, I like your the way you approach it in terms of taking risk with folks because what we have found is that when we're doing recruiting work, they want someone who's done it somewhere else, mm -hmm. yeah. the exact same thing, yeah. and or, and they want a stair step kind and of where, career. Where's that diversity? Right, like, right, right. Where's exactly. The different exactly. background or experience. It, it, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And what we're trying to do is position them to say, hey, this person has transferable skills that 
although they have not had an opportunity to display them in their career today, have indicated they not only have the interest and the aptitude and the ability, and maybe you should look at this person and we will put them forth as a part of a diverse slate. They say, hey, here's the folks that you know have done it somewhere else. You know, it's not really a stretch for them. And here's someone else who this job would be a stretch for and they're hungry for. And I think organizations do have to take more of a risk um, to say, hey, and then put in supports because maybe there's HR support. Maybe there's team support, mentoring that this person could come in and learn very, very quickly um, the organization and the job that needs to be done. And, and don't be af afraid to pivot. Right. Fail yeah. fast. Yeah. You know, like get them into a different role. If the role's not right for right. them, pivot. You know, they, they, there's plenty of things to do at all of our organizations. So I think that's absolutely excellent. And I like the idea of failing fast. So let's kind of work on that a little bit. We've put the diverse team together. We've overcome any obstacles. Maybe we've up, up worked inside our own organizations. We've got a high functioning team. They're working away. And then we take our focus off of them. So talk about some of the pitfalls. Sometimes we've done all this work to get a high functioning team in place. We've checked all the mental boxes. And then you're all sitting there going, what happened to them? You know, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, I, people sometimes look at this as a destination. Like, hey, I've gotten here. Right. You know, I'm, I'm here now. You know, I'm, it's good. But it's really, it, it's, it's a process. It, it's like anything else in life. And the easiest thing that I can say, make it analogous to is losing weight. You know, I'm, I mean, I've been very heavy in my life. I've been over 300 pounds, and I've been a lot lighter than that. But the thing is, is if you stop doing the things that got you there, guess what? You gain it again. Same thing in organizations. If you stop paying attention, if you stop being intentional, if you stop taking risk, those things will go away. So you have to continually engage yourself to do these things on a continual basis. Or if not, you're just going to slide right back down the mountain again. Yep. Yeah, I mean, Adam, you know, you're hearing the word intention, right? Yes. right? So, yeah, Anthony Mays, who's one of our fellow Googlers who works a lot in this space, says, if you do not intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. So when you get to that point and you're feeling comfortable, you know, mm -hmm. weight gain, you know, weight loss is good. When you take your eye off the intentionality, then you will unintentionally get back. I mean, right. it's happened right. to all of us, right. Right? Right. right? And so intention is there. And then there's also the notion of upping your game. Okay, now you're there. What more can you do? What other people can you reach? I really, really love Google's mission, which is to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful to all. So what does that mean? That means that if you're an able-bodied person with high bandwidth and you know capacity uh, in terms of internet access, you've got it. But what about the rest of the world? What about if you're not in a country that has, you know, high internet capacity and doesn't have, you know, ways to communicate easier, as, as easily as, as the U.S.? So if you up your game and you have a mission statement that is so far out there that you have to constantly and intentionally work on it, that may sort of help get over that contention. I think that was all beautifully said, so I don't, I don't know if I have anything else to add. Excellent. So um, the next question, let's think about this for a second, is everybody's, I'm sure the next question is in people's minds. This is great, great stuff, high-functioning teams, I'm all in. But, you know, I still have to sell my widget. I've still got to make income. So this is a lot of work, and I'm not sure what the return on is. But as we know, there is research out there that shows that there is a high return on uh, firms that use diverse and inclusive teams, not only on the team's output, but also with the changing landscape of the consumer, right? The buying power and the consumer base is changing rapidly out there. So talk to us for a few minutes about how having a diverse and inclusive team helps a firm actually be better able to compete in a landscape of consumers that seems to be changing almost daily. I mean, all the, all the data is out there, right? right. So we, we already know that, that this is fact or can be treated as fact. And so I think the question is, is that you would also expect that your clients are going to want to see or your customers are going to want to see your evolution. Right. 
Um, and so it's interesting now. We used to, you know, I, I don't know how you all operate in your in, in your places of work, but we used to have like a client floor where you like it's more formal. It's like maybe there's glassware for water and all this stuff, and it would be like really separated from where all the cubicles are and the droves of people and the dim lighting and the water cooler. But now what's interesting is that we're really proud of the work that we're doing at BlackRock. And so now it, it, the client area is the work area. Right. And right. so I think what you also want to do is you want to expose your clients and your customers to your workforce. And I think when you bring together that diverse group of people to meet with your clients, I think we, let's go back to this morning's talk yeah. on innovation. Like they were gonna, they're gonna wanna th see all of you challenge the status quo and challenge the way that you're doing things. Otherwise, they're gonna move on to the next, right. you know, the next provider. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say inclusive practices lead to inclusive products, right, which serve the experience as we were told earlier. So, you know, I'll give you two or three examples. I talked about live transcribe, which allows someone who's experiencing hearing loss to actually see uh, transcription of conversation. Think about, um, you know, the Pixel phone. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of inclusion that went into the Pixel phone. I'm sure a number of us maybe have had the experience of taking selfies or taking pictures with others, then you have to adjust the brightness so you can actually appear, right? And so if you have inclusive practices in creating that product, then you understand the needs of a different group, and then you can capitalize on that and sell product. Um, and the third thing is uh, Next Billion Users, which is an initiative that we have, which is in emerging markets to understand the local context. How many of you have been to countries outside of the US where Google Maps doesn't typically work the way it would in the US, <laughs> right? The roads are not just as smooth. Maybe there's motorcycles, pathways, taxi cabs. So having folks who are part of that next billion users initiative to provide contextual information then creates a product and service that can bring a good return to your business and provide a good experience. You know, one last thing I would add is just transparency. And what you'll find throughout this process of building a diverse and inclusive um, culture and workplace is the more transparency that you provide to your employees in terms of how things work or how you would like for them to work and who they can be in that workspace, the more, the more transparent that it will be to your customers. Because your employees, whether they're now or former employees, are going and talking about you on Glassdoor. They are talking about you on, on social media. And so when, when, when companies have these credos about, hey, this is what, who and what we are, people, when they're looking for jobs, will go out and look on these things to say, how transparent? Is this really true? Are they living up to their promise or at least attempting to live up to their promise? And if there's a lot of transparency, you'll find that, hey, yeah, they are. They're, they're trying. It, they're not maybe not succeeding at the level that they would like to, but they are trying. They're making an effort. And people that have been current or former employees are saying that. One last thing I would add, too, it. about just being more you know, commercial and making sure that we're really focused on the community around us and how we operate. Um, Ten years ago, we talked about how global we need to be. Mm. Well, now we need to be very local, and we need to understand exactly what's going on in our backyards. Um, if BlackRock was a New York City, Wall Street financial services company that steamrolled into Atlanta last year, I can promise you we wouldn't be very successful. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here and having met so many amazing people at this right. conference. Um, and so understanding that, like, I can't bring thought leaders from BlackRock to Atlanta to talk about retirement, well, retirement would go on deaf ears in Atlanta. What we need to be talking about is emergency savings and understanding the income inequality that exists in the community around us. And so it's really just having a pulse on what's going on. Um, and that really plays into exactly how we're building diverse cultures and really representing the community and breaking down the walls between our workplace and then the community around us. That's fantastic. So what does that look like? So we're building these teams and we're looking at all this. What does management buy-in look like? And not just the level above us, right? I mean, we need high-end, probably C-suite, owner, 
level buy-in to really be effective with these teams and building them out and having them see the vision that we see kind of more in the line role. So talk to us a little bit about some strategies or difficulties and how you've overcome them in getting the C-suite or really kind of that key executive sponsor on board that will stand up and go, no, this is the right way to go and kind of help lead that charge for you. You know, one of the things that we work with some of those folks with is just being vulnerable mm. because many of them have been in leadership and management for 40 years. And the workforce that's coming in today is very different, have very different expectations than those that are in leadership. And what I work with them on is being more open and transparent and being more authentic and allowing people to see how that team works. Because if people think that leadership is a black box and you're saying, hey, this is how you should work, then the natural question is, well, how are you working? And they have to be transparent and show how are they being candid? How are they being trustworthy? How are they handling mistakes? How are they failing fast? All of those things, they have to really live that. Right. So it can't just be, hey, I'm going to sponsor it, go out and do it. I'm going to stay per the same person I was. But it really has to really for every member of that leadership team be a process of evolution in their own personal and leadership development so that they can show and display it to those that they are leading in the company. Um, spot on, right? And I'll go back to something you said earlier, which is transparency, right? right? So data does not lie. And so one of the <laughs> things that's... <laughs> Uh, yeah, one of the things that's publicly available at Google is a diversity report, right? So publishing a diversity report that everyone can look at and say, oh, you know, maybe you need to move the needle here, maybe you need to move the needle there. That transparency, willingness to offer it, and then intentionally putting practices in place. That's sort of the top down. But I go back to the grassroots and the ERGs. They are a source of information and leadership, whether or not you know, you've worked in the workforce for 40 years and don't quite buy into what this is, <laughs> the, the force of the ERGs will tell you there's something here that you need to focus on. I would just say an openness and a willingness from the C-suite, uh, like, and a humbleness. Like if, if they're not willing to sit down with your youngest employees and really listen, I mean active listening, you know, like actually hearing and learning from them. You know, for example, like, so my husband joined Google almost 10 years ago, and he's still with Google. He joined because of the free food, right? <laughs> hey, l hey, let's be honest. You go where you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, but now he f he's found Google to be their home or his home. And now, though, the, the Gen Zers, they're not joining Google because of, and I don't mean to speak for you, but for the free food, they're joining our companies because of the purpose, because of our social impact, because of the stance maybe on climate. Um, but, you know, so at the end of the day, it's very easy for a 60-year-old executive to be very detached from that reality, but it's important for them to be spending time with the, really, the future of the workforce. So kind of the overarching goal or the overarching theme for us is diversity and inclusion and innovation. So let's just kind of dive right at it here in kind of the final few minutes, right? Can you guys enlighten our group today on where you have seen a high-functioning, diverse and inclusive team really add to the innovation in your firms and where that has just been a, a, a source of just unbelievable output from them? Before I became a consultant, I was the director of global diversity and inclusion for Terex in, in, in Connecticut. And 70% of our company was outside of the United States. And it was very different and very diverse. And where we found diversity and inclusion work was on the shop floor. Because we went from, you know, a kind of a batch and queue to a just in time, um, you know, manufacturing process where we really kind of made the person that was closest to the work in charge of telling those who were leading, hey, this is what would be more efficient in terms of how to place this line to, to build this crane. And once that happened, 
that's when you see the innovation because then leadership is open to the idea of, hey, it's a different way of doing it. I wouldn't have thought of doing it that way. They got together, they teamed, and they brought the solution to leadership, and the leadership just said, hey, this is a great way. Go out and do it. There was ownership. There was empowerment. They were invested in that solution, and it worked. And, I mean, we were building some of the biggest cranes in the world. We were building cranes that would lift 500,000 tons. But we had innovative ways of doing that, not because we had leadership that was so smart, but because those that were doing the work actually spoke up and said, hey, we can do it differently, and they listened. Yeah, I mean, there's just a ton of products and services that would not exist if we did not have a diverse workforce. Um, some of the ones that come to mind, at least top of mind for me, something like Google Assistant, right? being able to give you intelligence and information that you wouldn't have had. Um, Google Translate, I mean, think about how many languages can be translated. And honestly, there's some, some really interesting stories about people's lives being saved because of the fact that they could speak in one language, have translate translated to another language so the doctor can understand what's going on with you. So some really life-saving things. And then thinking about things like YouTube and video and ads, just the, the different thought process that has gone into it because of the diversity of mind, age, and, 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 and other dimensions, that's just been incredible for us. Innovation is definitely a product of inclusion, especially, especially if it helps empower a formerly marginalized community. I love it. I, um, been a great discussion, but I, I just have to, to tell a quick story on sort of when we were evaluating different markets around the United States on where we would open a new operation for BlackRock. And um, I come back to, you know, when we were meeting with our senior executives and making recommendations, um, they kept asking questions about the Atlanta workforce, and they were expecting me to lead with the 300,000 undergrads just the, the sheer ethnic diversity and the international population here and all of this stuff. But what I kept leading with was the diversity of, of companies mm. and the startup environment and the higher education environment. And so when we got down here, what we ended up doing was building a, a, a center of excellence for our client experience. And it's a platform that's growing because the way we interact with our clients around the world is, is growing, is very important. We operate in 100 countries. We deal with financial regulations, as you can imagine, that are different in every, in every domicile. Um, and the diversity of clients that we manage money for. And so we started hiring people. We hired people from Delta Airlines. And they look at me like, why are we hiring someone? They don't understand what we do. And I'm like, you know what they do understand? Is the importance of the client and the customer because it's very easy for that Delta customer to then go buy a Southwest ticket. Right. They also fly out of Hartsfield. Yeah. So it's like at the end of the day, it's like they put the consumer first. And we're a B2B business. We're not used to that. So at the end of the day, it's like that diversity of background and experience and that client first mindset has allowed us to transform our culture. That's amazing. So um, we've talked on it a little bit, right? We've mentioned BRGs, ERGs. It's basically the same thing, right? It's, it's diverse groups. There's research out there, though, that shows that firms that have truly high-functioning, diverse, and inclusive teams, their inclusive measures by different standards is actually far outstripes firms that only have BRGs or ERGs. So talk to us a little bit about how these high-functioning, diverse teams actually form a better sense of inclusion than maybe just having ERGs and BRGs alone. I think, again, it goes back. I, I can't, it, I'll belabor this point. It's about <laughs> intentionality, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, putting, <laughs> the, putting those programmatic efforts in place. Because after all, you know, outsourcing diversity and inclusion to ERGs is not the purpose, right? It's collecting a different lens. Now. If you pin all your hopes on, on people of a certain uh, group and they leave, then what happens, right? right? You've, you've lost that inclusiveness. So what you have to do is put those structures in place that will empower the workforce outside of the ERGs. I would just add on the ERG point, I think something that we've been really focused on the last two years has been around, it's great that you have a black professionals network. 
it's great that you have an LGBTQ network. It's great that you're establishing these ERGs, but the, the fact is, as much energy as you're putting into establishing them, you need to be focused on the ally portion right. of the ERG. Our Black Professionals Network would not be nearly as successful if it's not the BPN and allies network. Same with our out, or LGBTQ network, and allies. And so the more that we focus on allies, driving that inclusion, bringing people together to support one another, that's critical. You know, one, one last thing I want to add about diversity inclusion just in general is that we're all looking for something to do in with diversity. Um, but I always caution companies to say, you need to think about this. You talked about the process that your organization went through in selecting Atlanta. There was a thoughtful, disciplined process that you used to come to that decision. The same type of thoughtful um, examination should be done with diversity and inclusion. And what I find is, is that companies sprint ahead and do all of these things without examining their culture, with examining what kind of diversity they need. Is it behavioral diversity? Is it demographic diversity? Is it both? And if so, how much? What kind? Um, what, are they, what are the human resources implement, implications of it? So in doing all of these things, you have to be very thoughtful. I've never seen a company just open up um, a brick and mortar store on any corner. They have data that says, hey, this is the traffic, this is the kind of traffic, these are the people, these are our customers, this is where they come. They come by this location all the time. So it's important for organizations to say, hey, I want to do something, but thinking is doing something. Yep. That's excellent. Let me ask the panel one more question, then we'll open it up to questions in the back. Um, so as we're trying to put these teams together, Right, and one of the reasons that we study conscious and unconscious biases, right, that actually goes back to a self-preservation that's kind of just ingrained in us naturally who we are. So we are naturally going to feel more at home with a homogenous group of people that maybe we self-identify with. We start creating these diverse and inclusive teams. How do we now create a sense of safety inside those teams that allows everybody to open up and share and really bring their best parts of their thought processes, their backgrounds, their cultural experiences, to this team to enrich them? Because we have limited time, I'm just going to get straight to the point. I, I would say, <laughs> you know, the thing that I found that works best is you don't shoot the messenger. When someone opens up and is vulnerable with you in private or in public, what I found what happens in public meetings is someone will say something and then they become the lightning rod. And that is showing everyone else in the room, hey, you might not want to say stuff like that again. Because if you do, you're going to get hammered down. And you have to really be able to have that trust that when someone speaks truth to power, that it's really taken into account and that you don't shoot the messenger. I would say three things. Assume good intent. Built a culture that assumes good intent. Built a culture that's inclusive and allows for those safe places. And then, wow, allyship, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Without allyship, you lose out on a lot. And I would just, I would just add to reiterate the trust, and it's okay to have a friendly, to hire friendly people too. Uh, I, I also think that you know there's a lot of cutthroat work environments out there. I think it's very important to support one another, break down the walls between personal, and professional, be there for one another. Okay, so the question is about intersectionality and about allyship, so the two themes. So for those of you who may not know what intersectionality is about, it's that notion that you can come into a room with multiple identities, right? So you could be 
a female and you could be black. So you have two experiences that you're bringing into the room that put you in a certain intersectional group. And so one of the ways, I mean, there's no easy answer to that, is ensuring that people understand that this is not just a woman coming into the room. This is a woman who identifies, uh, this is a person who identifies as a woman, but also has some microaggression, uh, micro, what did you call them? Micro aggression that c they could have had as a black person. So those are two things that come in. Allyship, I think, is one of the ways to combat that, yep. ensuring you have a good allyship group. Yeah, I would just say uh, start with allyship because uh, intersectionality naturally starts to occur, right? You naturally start to identify these differences and commonalities am amongst people. Well, thank you, panel. I just want to say thank As you can see, we're being forced to stop. This is a topic that we can talk on for hours. I want to thank all of you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Appreciate it.